Hey class, I wanted to go over the slide PowerPoint that I have on how the U.S. got so involved in Latin America. Let me show you. As the U.S. transitioned in the early 1900s, so many good things for the U.S. are happening. We're fighting against the Spanish oppression, as you see in this slide. We're helping to remove Spain from Cuba, the Philippines, and Puerto Rico. In 1903, we take over the Panama Canal for the Colombians. During this time, we spread out worldwide, becoming a superpower. But I'm not going to concentrate on what happened in Puerto Rico, Cuba, but more so how we got so involved once again with Mexico. So a decade after the Civil War, notice we have the Big Brother policy and that was created by James G. Blaine. And it is kind of like an extension of the Monroe Doctrine. If you don't remember the Monroe Doctrine in 1823, stated that the American continent will not be considered a subject for future colonization by any European powers. So James Blaine, who brings back the Monroe Doctrine, wants to establish more connections with Latin America for trade, also for, for support. And this is how we are known later on as the octopus, as you see in the next slide. Another example of US economic involvement is by the United Fruit Company. That becomes widely known as the Banana Wars. If you see in this map, all these countries in blue, Central America, all the way down to Ecuador. The banana industry in North America became huge and very powerful. The U.S. is accused, along with the United Fruit Company, of bribing government officials in exchange for preferential treatment, exploiting its workers, paying little by way of taxes of the government of the countries where it operated, and working ruthlessly to consolidate monopolies. And this is the beginning of the U.S. becoming widely known as the octopus, as you see in this picture right here, El Pulpo in Spanish. Briefly, the Spanish-American War was so important. As you can see, how the U.S. support of the Cuban Revolution, we have the war with Spain in Cuba and the Philippines, Cuba becomes independence. We ended up securing Guantanamo. We still have it. U.S. extends power through military force in the Philippines. From this point on, in the next slide, we can see how the U.S. from 1898 all the way up to 1920s, there are over dozens of U.S. interventions throughout Latin America. In 1904, we have Theodore Roosevelt, who puts in practice the Monroe Doctrine by preventing any European country from taking military action in Latin America to collect debt that was owned to them. His policy became known as the Roosevelt Colorado. In his own words, any Latin American nation engaged in chronic wrongdoing a phrase that included large debt or civil unrest, the U.S. will intervene. And he's known by his big stick policy, which means speak softly and carry a big stick, you will go far. And actually that's from a Chinese proverb. A good example of U.S. intervention in Latin America happens in Panama in 1903. The U.S. has eyes in the Panama Canal and they support Panamanians to break away from Colombia. Not that they wanted to support Panama, they just wanted to grab the Panama Canal because, as you know, it is really important in terms of connecting both oceans. By 1909, we have a new president, and that's William Howard Taft. And we are already involved in the Mexican Revolution. 
but he wanted to move away from the big stick policy from Theodore Roosevelt. And he wanted to use a more humane approach. He called it the dollar diplomacy. And he wanted to encourage U.S. investment in Latin America. By 1913, we have a new president, and that's Woodrow Wilson. And he has that moral diplomacy in which he believed that the U.S. should be the conscience of the world, spread democracy, promote peace, and U.S. interest. Uh, sounds like a little bit like the manifest destiny. But Woodrow Wilson gets involved with the Mexican Revolution, and because of it, indirectly, indirectly, we fall into World War I. As I mentioned before, Woodrow Wilson becomes so involved in Mexico that he wanted to remove Victoriano Huerta because he didn't like it. He thought he was ruthless. And with the Mexican government, they created a coup d'etat against Huerta and they put in power Carranza. Once again, this is the U.S. calling the shots, running Mexico, protecting Mexico because there's a lot of U.S. investment in Mexico. During President Woodrow Wilson, that's how the U.S. is forced to go into World War I. There's the infamous Zimmerman telegram. It's a telegram sent to Mexico. It's intercepted by the U.K., but then later the U.K. releases it, the U.S., it and he, the U.S. finds out that Germans wants to help Mexicanos with the conditions that if Mexico helps the Germans, the Germans will help retake the Southwest and give it back to Mexico. The causes of the Mexican Revolution, one is based on the Hacienda system, most of the land owned by a few, the Casta system, which is based on race and racism, you have a large marginalized population of indigenous and mestizos living in extreme poverty. And corruption in U.S. involvement goes hand in hand with the Mexican government who keeps all the poor people under control so they can be exploited by foreign investment. Haciendas were large, vast land that were owned by a few in Mexico and throughout Latin America. The workers, most of them were indigenous people, poor people. They were called peons. In most cases, they live on the hacienda. They sort of have to pay rent there. And their labor was harsh. And the dynamic of this labor was almost indentured. Um, it was almost a type of modern form of slavery. Even though they were not slaves, they had to work in the land for free. So the poor people of Mexico, peasants, the indigenous, were in such a tremendous disadvantage for not owning land, having to work for El Patron, the boss, who ended up owning all this land. Another factor of the Mexican Revolution is based on the caste system. It was a racist system in which the criollo was on top, and all those who were mixed were in the bottom. And that's why I have on the slide El Grito, because Father Hidalgo wanted to liberate all the oppressed of Mexico. This racial dynamic created so much tension in Mexico, where the poor always felt oppressed. Mexico tried to resolve the problem of injustice, of how most of the poor people were landless. Tierra y Libertad, which later is going to become the banner for Zapata. And during this time of Benito Juarez, there is a law called La Ley de Lerdo, the Lerdo Law, that confiscated the land for the church. And the idea was to sell this land to the poor. But then again, how the poor was going to be able to buy land, and the one who ended up buying the land, once again, was the rich, and the status of the poor remaining the same. When you watch the documentary, The Storm That Swept Mexico, it's going to go more in details 
of how these personalities become the heroes or the villains of the Revolución Mexicana. In this picture, we have Francisco Madero who challenges Porfirio Diaz. And we're going to talk about the Porfiriato because it's really important to understand is one of the main reasons why Mexico had it and they were fed up of it. Then we have my main leader, who I honestly believe that he's one of the best heroes that Mexico have had, and that's Emiliano Zapata. And in this picture right here, we have Doroteo Arango, Pancho Villa, which will cover a little bit of him, very controversial figure, but to my to my knowledge, he was a little bit of a sketchy man. So let's get right to the Porfiriato. Porfirio Diaz, 1876-1911. This guy ruled Mexico for about 30 years. It is called El Periodo de la Dictadura, a dictatorship. 30 years in power for many Mexicanos. He did good things. He brought progress. But at the same time, he divided the rich and the poor to a level that pushed Mexico to a war. Porfirio Diaz uh, belonged to a group of scientificos, the Spanish scientists, were a circle of technocrat advisors to Porfirio Diaz. They were very racist. Um, to summarize some of this, they believed that one of the reasons Mexico was, was backward and retarded to some extent is because the population of Mexico had a lot of indigenous people. And so he brought the idea of having Europeans to come into Mexico and invest. They can push Mexico into a new era of progress. He did an amazing things that did not really benefit Mexico, but it benefit the U.S. All this, what you see in blue, were railroad tracks. All these mega industries were delivering all the goods to the border so it can go to the U.S. 90% of the land at the time was given to European investors and also U.S. investors. That is how the U.S. is so involved in Mexico because they own, literally, most of the business that are created in Mexico and also they are protected by Porfirio Diaz. This slide, I'm going to summarize what were the accomplishments of Porfirio Diaz during his administration. And during his regime, he really modernized Mexico. He brought the Luz Eléctrica, the electric light in Mexico. A lot of the international business came and invest in Mexico, but at that time, like I mentioned, there ninety percent of all these foreign investors own most of the land in Mexico. During his administration, he concentrated on building or sort of connecting Mexico by ten thousand miles of train tracks, and he did a good job because he was connecting the rural areas to the cities. But if you notice in the slide before, most of these train tracks were all connected and reaching to the border where all these goods were going into the U.S. The arrival of new international corporations into local areas meant that mestizos, the indigenous farmers, became also the workers of these new firms that came from outside and these people got exploited. And every time that there was a resentment, Porfirio Diaz will send his private police force, known as the Rurales, to crush any rebellion. Then again, he ruled the country with a stick. Whoever wanted to rebel, he would crush any rebellion. Everyone in Mexico was fed up and the next slide that I have right here deals with Francisco Madero, who becomes the first hacendado who challenged the Porfiriato. Now, 30 years in power, a lot of people were just kind of tired of it. 
And this is when Francisco Madero challenged Porfirio Diaz. I'm going to let the film do its job because the storm that swept Mexico does an amazing job from this point on. How Francisco Madero, to some extent, manipulates Zapata and Villa to fight against Porfirio Diaz. And they succeed. And then they manage to remove Porfirio Diaz from power. And from that point on, the revolution becomes a crazy war because you're going to notice how the U.S. at the same time is calling the shops, is supporting some of these main leaders, and it becomes a chaos in Mexico for over a decade. And with this, I'm going to stop and I'm going to let the film do the rest. I hope you enjoyed the introduction. It's a lot to cover. My goodness, um, you can take a whole class for a whole semester just on the Mexican Revolution. And I'm looking forward to the next podcast that I'm going to have with you. Bye.